hope that we will never find ourselves a victim of or witness to a crime. But if we were, how confident are we that we would correctly identify the perpetrator or even remember accurately exactly what happened? My name's Graham Pike. I'm a professor of forensic cognition here at the Open University's Department of Psychology. Um, I teach and research in the area of forensic psychology uh, with a particular expertise in eyewitness memory. Eyewitness testimony is a particularly problematic area for, for several reasons. One of those reasons is the outcome of eyewitness testimony uh, can be very important. That if an eyewitness misidentifies someone, then an innocent person can be sent to prison. One of the other problems with it is the difference between everyday cognition, so how our brains work in everyday situations, and how they work in the very special scenario of seeing a crime. So we, our everyday experience of how our mind works is usually quite positive. We recognise our family and friends without any problems. Uh, you know, we remember what we're supposed to be doing. You know, our memories tend to work. It's only remembering quite difficult information we find problematic. But when it comes to a situation where you've seen somebody who's unfamiliar, for only a few seconds maybe, in a very stressful situation, in a scenario that's very unfamiliar to you, um, then we're not so good um, at being able to recognise that person. In fact, we're particularly bad, and we find it very difficult to um, remember the events. Even the order that they happened in can be something that we really struggle with. So eyewitnesses tend to make a lot of mistakes, but importantly, they don't realise that they're making them. Testing the reliability of eyewitness testimony is actually quite difficult. Uh, it's very hard to replicate exactly the situation that would happen in a court. For instance, um, what we can't do is commit really violent crimes in front of research participants because it would be unethical. We also can't introduce something called consequentiality. Now, that refers to the consequences of a decision that's taken. So the consequences in a court are really profound. What an eyewitness says can lead to somebody be convicted, to somebody walking free who committed a crime. There's no way really of replicating that in a research setting. Graham worked with the Greater Manchester Police on a fascinating television series that explored the issues around eyewitness behaviour through experiments and by staging convincing mock crimes in front of a group of volunteers. The series, called Eyewitness, revealed some intriguing insights into how our memories work and some of the common errors that eyewitnesses can make. Um, as a demonstration of human memory, we actually showed a piece of kind of modern art to our eyewitnesses and asked them to describe it and asked them to say kind of what it reminded them of. You could say it was fan-like in its shape. You got like the spokes, that could be like a bicycle wheel. A few weeks later, we then got them to draw from memory that piece of art. And what we found was that rather than replicate the piece of art, what the people tended to do was replicate what they'd said it looked like. So if the person had said, well, it kind of reminds me of a bicycle wheel, then what they drew was a bicycle wheel. So what they'd done was interpreted that piece of modern art as what it reminded them of, but then remembered it in terms of that. So not exactly how it looked, but what it reminded them of. And it was that that they reproduced. You give them the picture. The research being done by Graham and his colleagues in this fascinating field of study, along with our growing knowledge of how our memories work, and the use of modern technologies is starting to offer very practical help to those working in criminal investigation dealing with eyewitnesses. There were some really good examples of eyewitness errors that were made in the eyewitness series. The second crime uh, that we staged was an armed robbery um, with most of the people wearing ski masks so that you couldn't see any, like balaclavas, you couldn't really see anything in their face, but there, there were eyes, eye holes. And one of the eyewitnesses obviously remembered that the eye region of the face was somehow different. Um, and his brain constructed a story to try to explain that. But rather than say the person was wearing a ski mask, 
he thought they were wearing sunglasses. And it wasn't just the fact he said they were wearing sunglasses, which was completely wrong. He went into great detail about what sunglasses looked like. So he described the brand, he described the, the shape of the lenses, he described the, 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 the color of the, the bits that go over your ears. But all of that information was completely made up. His brain had constructed. And what was really, I guess, surprising and really illustrative of one of the problems with Bartman's testimony is he completely believed it. For him, the experience of remembering the sunglasses which didn't exist was exactly the same as the experience of remembering details that did exist. Pretty sure he was wearing sunglasses. My work and other research in psychology really, I think, has two things to offer. The first is that we uh, can act as a, a warning to the criminal justice system. So that if we find that an eyewitness is, or eyewitnesses in general are unable to do something or are fairly inaccurate, we can warn them not to rely on that information. The other thing we can do is by studying how the mind works and how investigative procedures and courtroom procedures kind of make the most of how the mind works, we can change those procedures. Um, improve them. So hopefully what we can do is improve the accuracy of the information you gain from an eyewitness to try and stop uh, an eyewitness identifying the wrong person, to try and help them uh, remember information more accurately and more completely. One example of that are the video identification parades uh, that are used in the UK. It used to be prior to 2003 that a police officer would have to scour the streets trying to find about nine or ten people that looked just like the suspect and that's a very hard thing to do. And we know that those parades tended to be quite unfair on the suspect. With a video identification system there's a very large database of thousands of faces um, that can be searched and you can put together a, a parade based on that database. Technology is also helping in terms of what's known as facial composite images, so EFITs and PhotoFITs. The original systems, such as the original PhotoFit and IdentiKit system, uh, were found by psychologists to be very inaccurate because they really didn't work in a way um, that kind of made the most of human cognition. So the way we remember faces is we remember the whole face. Uh, we, we remember it what's known as holistically, which means the, the whole face. But the way those early systems worked was to try to get people to construct a face by picking out, um, first of all, the eyes and then a nose. You'd look through hundreds of eyes and try and pick the right one. Now, memory just doesn't work like that. You, you find it very hard to, to pick out somebody's eyes, particularly if you don't know them well. So modern systems have been um, introduced, computer systems that are based on knowledge of how uh, human psychology operates, um, so that now what you see is a whole face and you kind of create an image of the suspect by manipulating the whole face. So forensic psychology um, is informing criminal justice system and helping to improve police investigative procedures all the time. <laughs>